24 through 30, right? Yeah. All right. Well, as um, Nevin said, I'll be reading Matthew 13. For those of you who want to follow along, I'll start at verse 24. <clears throat> it says, Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not um, sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then go? Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. May the Lord bless reading of his word. But I'm still going to preach, and you know, today's the day after Christmas, but it's also the last Sunday before we're into 2022. And I'm going to talk about, there's something very important in the beginning of that parable that I never really noticed until I was studying for today's sermon. And we're going to talk about why we were sleeping in a minute, but I want to tell you something. I want to tell you some good news. You know, for a long time... I've struggled with Christmas because I see all the good that Christmas does. And I see a lot of people do celebrate the birth of Jesus. And I see things like um, Operation Christmas Child and things that are doing all sorts of good things. But I've also studied the traditions and stuff and see where some of the traditions come from and um, some of the things like that. And so I've seen both sides of this Christmas, and I've actually come to a piece about it. So let's take just a quick minute to look at this, because, you know, when I say traditions, not all traditions are bad. And sometimes we have this feeling like all traditions are bad. But we see 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Therefore, brothers, stand fast and hold your tra the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistles. So this was to the church, but we have something that tells us the good traditions that the apostles taught, right? I'm holding it here in my hand. This is the Bible. And so there's traditions we do, like we have the love feast, the feet washing, communion, uh, anointing those that are sick, praying over them. We have a lot of traditions we do that are good traditions, that are things we've been taught. And there's other traditions we do that aren't related to church. You know, we have family traditions. They're not bad by nature just because you're doing a tradition. We have 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. So we see it's important in the church that we use the Bible to create our traditions, correct? that we use this as the form and the example that we have for our traditions, just like the, um, it mentions they met on the first day of the week. And so a lot of churches today meet on Sunday. We're following the traditions of the early church and of the apostles. But then we have the traditions of men. And that's why we got to be careful. And we saw this in Col well, we saw this last week in Matthew, but in Colossians 2, Verses 6 through 8, as ye have therefore received Christ, Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy of vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So notice we have a difference here. We have what the Lord has instructed us to do with our faith in Christ, and then we have the traditions of men. And what's really important here, folks, is that our faith is not rooted in the traditions of men. It's pretty plain and simple. 
Mark 7, verses 5 through 7, Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thou disciples according to the tradition of the elders? But he bred with unwashed hands. He answered and said unto them, Well, hath Elias said, Prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, The people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Now stop right here, folks. This is the core of it. What is your heart? And this goes with anything you do. You know, God constantly says in the Old Testament, it's not sacrifice I desire. It's that your heart would be with me. It's that you obey me. So even if you're doing a godly tradition, if you're doing it with the wrong heart, it's useless, right? You've got to have the right heart in what you're doing. How bad in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines, the teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men? For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men, and the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. And so this is what God's given me a piece about. As Christians, we have a liberty to celebrate a day if we want to, or not to celebrate. And if your heart, you celebrate December 25th, and you're celebrating the birth of Christ, there's nothing wrong with it. That's the way I feel, because that's a Christian liberty we're given. And, you know, the other traditions, the family thing, those are all fine, because in your heart, I don't think anyone here is worshiping pagan gods. Am I safe to say that? that that's not our desires. But we also have to be aware that this should not be um, because we're not commanded in the Bible to celebrate this, that we should not make this, well, if you don't celebrate Christmas the way I do, then you're not a Christian. Does that make sense to everyone? We shouldn't, we shouldn't be hard on people because maybe it, there's things about it they, they disagree with because the secularism that's come up and things like that. So really God gave me peace on that. You see, I'm even wearing a red tie and not a green one for the Grinch. So Merry Christmas, everyone. And again, as long as in our heart, what we're celebrating is the birth of Christ. And, you know, all those other things, I think those are good things, spending time with your family, doing things like that. So maybe you all already came to this piece and you're way ahead of me, and that's great. But God gave me peace this season where I've actually enjoyed Christmas more than I've enjoyed it though for a while. I'm kind of grinchy, just being honest. But now let's get to what I want to talk about. You know, in our Sunday school, we've been going through this book, and I saw this graph, and I haven't been able to get this graph out of my head. Now, how many people remember seeing this graph in Sunday school? It's talking about the declining church membership in America. And, you know, I tried to find this chart, and what I found out is this isn't just in America while trying to find a chart. I ended up just copying it out of the book. But there's charts of Australia, there's charts of Europe, and they all look the same. This church membership is declining everywhere. And, you know, we talked a lot about this in Sunday school and about the way the world is going and how that's affecting the church. But I want to get to something a little bit deeper. And I want to talk about while we were sleeping. Let's look at the parable Ray read, and let's pay attention. Another parable put forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which showed good seed in his field. And we know that this is talking about the Son of Man. This is talking about Jesus. He is the good man that sowed. But notice it's man there. Pay attention to verse 25. But while men slept, is that the same? That's plural. That's not talking about the good man. That's talking about the people that are supposed to be watching the field. While men slept, his enemy came and so tared among the wheat and went his way. Folks, the men that slept there, to me, is the church. We're going to get into that. But I want you to think about that. And what happens? But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. 
So the servants of the householder came and said unto them, Sir, dost not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then, then that we go and gather them up? So notice that the enemy has sowed the tares while men slept. And what happens is they're now in with the good wheat. But God lets them there until when? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Now, folks, this just can't be the church in the world because they're together. This means that the tares are in the church, too. And the tares are getting more and more. And God doesn't want to root up just the tares because he'll end up destroying a lot of good people when he's taking out the bad people. Let both grow together until the harvest. Folks, the harvest is the end of the world. We see that in Revelations. We see it throughout. And we know that that time is coming faster and faster. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And you know, if you look at Revelations, you see a similar passage where it talks about gathering, reaping those that are going to go through the wrath of God, like grapes, if you remember the mention in Revelation. And then those that aren't are the ones that are going to be saved and go to be with Jesus. So who is to blame? You know, we see this over and over again. Church attendance is just dropping and dropping. We see that the nation is becoming more secular, more pagan, more uh, like the rest of the world like the evil of the world, and less like the church of Christ or the church of God that it should be. And here is a short video clip just talking a little bit about what's happened in America. So cultural Marxism would be that type of activity in any society that breaks down the culture in such a way so that people instinctively turn to government as an alternative for the support that they otherwise would have. This is done through art, and through music, it's through literature, it's through motion pictures and that kind of thing. It's the implanting of certain ideas and concepts which make them very ripe for the philosophy of collectivism and makes them very ripe for turning to government as the big daddy, the big solver of all problems. In the 1960s, the church pulled back from the culture. Basically what happened the church gave up in the mid-60s. It came up on prayer in schools. It gave up on being a, a force in society. I mean, Johnson uh, shackled the church uh, when he uh, said that, uh, when he used the 501c3 to say the churches couldn't talk about politics and the church just buckled under. When prayer was taken out of school, the church buckled under. When the church collapsed from Hollywood, uh, they buckled under. So it was the church's internal collapse and that has happened before in history and unless people get revival, reformation, renewal, we will never reclaim the culture. Okay, sorry that was a little soft, but I don't know if you heard what he said. And basically what he said is that the church buckled under. The church, the church is what caved in and led the way to all these things that have happened. And folks, he's absolutely right. The church, instead of dictating the culture, now the culture dictates the church. And we see a church that nowadays wants to be like the world. Not be ye separate, but be one with the world. And folks, this is important. This is what's going on, and it's not going to get better. As long as things remain that way. As long as the church just stays silent. As long as the church isn't willing to get its hands dirty. As long as the church isn't willing to stand up, then who is there to stand up for God? And you know, it may sound like a broken record here, and it sounds like I'm saying the same thing a lot. Well, that's because I need to see effect. Not just in dry run, but everywhere. We hear people all the time. 
We're like, yes, I'm going to trust in God. I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to do what God tells me. And the next day, they're running out, listening to the TV, listening to the world, and they're right back where they were before Sunday. Believe in everything the world says, just doing, going along with everything the world says. And hey, that's exactly what Satan wants us to do. He's the God of this world. You know, I had somebody that I like read Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, the beginning of it. And it just struck me how what we associate Jesus with and what Jesus actually was is different today. And you know, one of the things that happened to the church in the past 50 to 80 years is we've gone from this, you know what, I don't like the pastors that talk about sin. I don't like the pastors that talk about hell. Let's just talk about love all the time. Let's just be positive and only say positive things in church. And let's just be positive. And you know what, we've had 50 years of that and look where we're at. It's not working, okay? It hasn't worked. It failed. The church has failed. Don't blame the world. Blame ourselves. We failed. We were silent. We didn't stand up. We just tried to be positive when this world is not positive. Sin is not positive. Yeah, there's times to be positive. But we got to stop blaming everyone else but ourselves. And that's what I thought about that picture, that graph. We like to blame everyone else. Yet here we are, we're doing the same things, expecting a different result. Matthew 5, this is Jesus' most famous sermon probably. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountains. And when he was said, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Folks, I'm not angry, I'm heartbroken. There's a difference. I'm frustrated. I want to help people. But if you're not going to take the Lord and His Word seriously, and you're going to believe the world, and you're going to trust in the world, I can't help you. And neither can God. If you're going to break forth from that, and you're going to trust in Him like it says to do, and we're going to be a community together in Christ, then we can do amazing things. Amazing things. God still works miracles. I believe that 100%. Don't take this as me being angry because I'm heartbroken. Frustrated. The truth will set us free. It's not there to shackle us. The world, the lies, the devil is the one who wants us trapped. Who trapped you in your houses a year and a half ago? Was it God? Or was it the devil? Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, so they shall be fulfilled. Church, if I could do something, if we could do something, could we hunger and thirst for righteousness? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And what happens to these people? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Folks, we're getting to that point. Some of us, have a hard time now at our Christmas dinner because we have parts of our family that revile us because we won't go along, because we trust in God, because they want to follow the world. 
Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt lost its flavor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is there thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Folks, if we're just going to keep on doing the same thing that we've done for the past 50 years, then just stay at home. Because we're good for nothing. And you know the most ignorant thing I can hear a Christian say is, well, that doesn't bother me because I'm saved. I don't care what, what the truth is. Well, good for you. Then stay home and wait for the Lord. But some of us want to get other people saved because everyone out there is going to hell. That's who I want to help. And as long as I'm going to just sit still and do nothing, then how are they going to know the truth and the good news and the word? Folks, we're going in circles. And I'm not just picking on us. It's the whole church. All right? What's the, what's the definition of stupidity? Doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Every year we do the same thing. It's like a checklist. Okay, we got to do this for sweet for Valentine's Day. Then for Easter, we do this. And Latin service, we do this. Memorial Day, make sure you mention the veterans. You know, Fourth of July, make sure you do this. Labor Day, whatever. If we're just doing it to check a box, then we're not doing any good. It's not that those things are bad. But we're doing the same thing and we're expecting different results. But we're not getting them. When are we going to start trying some new stuff? I don't want to do the, keep doing the same thing. It doesn't work. What we've been doing for the past 50 years, you saw the chart. It's not working. Can we just admit it? It's okay. And the only way we're going to get starting to do the right thing is if we can admit we've been doing the wrong thing. And then we can start to get somewhere. I'm tired of walking in circles, folks. I don't care if I'm accepted with, you know, the popular preachers of wherever. I already know they don't like me. I'm not expecting a call from anybody. <laughs> I'm not expecting Fox News to call me. Well, I would go on. Trust me, I would say what I feel and give the gospel. But I want to help people. You know, there's people that want to know the truth. They want to, they know something's wrong. People know, there's a lot of people that know something wrong. It's the, you know, it's a lot of the Christians that don't seem to seem to be oblivious to what's going on right now and how the Antichrist is setting up his kingdom right in our face. And a lot of Christians going on like nothing's happening. And this is a great time to get people saved. Because they know something's wrong. And folks, when I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. I know I'm not saying it's all dry runs fault. Please don't take that this way. But we can start. We can be the light of this valley. Don't expect someone else to start it. You know, this has become one of my favorite passages. I'm not going to lie. Isaiah 56. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Folks, you know I'm going to bark and I'm going to keep on barking. The good ones even bark when they go to prison. Like pop-off that Ray's doing. When you're working for God, you're going to want to bark. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough, and they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his gain from his quarter. Come ye, say they, I will fetch wine, and will fill ourselves with strong drink, and tomorrow shall be as this day, 
and much more abundant. Folks, it's, they're living the same day. You see that? Over and over and over again. You know what I've noticed in the corporate world? Is every year, the companies I've been working for say, you know, we broke our record for a revenue this year. Good job. And then right away they turn away and say, now next year we got to get even more. It's like nothing is ever enough. That's the way of the world. For their own gain. They're living the same day, folks. It's Groundhog Day in the church. It's Groundhog Year. We've been living the same year. When do we as a church wake up? I don't have all the answers. I wish I did. But I know who does have all the answers. we got to start thinking outside the box of this box of the church that we've put ourselves in that, you know, we can't step on toes. Um, we're just going to do these things. we got to start thinking, how can we reach people? And I'm not saying we haven't been doing some of that. But we need to keep, that needs to be our focus. Our focus can't be, you know, well, look, another year, yay, we, we got everything done that we always get done. That's success. That's not success. Success is making a difference. Success is impacting those in this valley right here. Or by your house, wherever you may live. Listen, I'm going to fight until I go to be with the Lord. And only God knows how soon that is. But when I say fight, I don't mean physically fight. <laughs> I mean fight with this. This can change people's lives. If we can get people into the Word of God and show them how God predicted all these things that are happening and that He is the answer and He is the hope, isn't that what this time of year is about, hope? First Peter 1, 17-18 and if you call on the Father, who without respect of person judgeth according to every man's work, pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your Father. Listen, what Peter is saying here is the tradition this church that you're doing, where you just go to church and do the same thing and think that that's pleasing God, it's not. It's in vain. But with the precious blood of Christ, as the lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, does that not feel more true, true today than ever? Who by him do we believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God? Folks, that's what I want. I want the dry run church of the brethren, our faith and hope might be in God might be in Jesus Christ. And you know what? Maybe I took out some of my frustration today. Because why is it that I should feel like I have to preach on the wise men or shepherds today? When that's not what the world needs. The world, yeah, the world needs, that's not that there's anything wrong with that, but the world needs Jesus Christ and the hope that he brings to everyone. You know, you've, I've figured out if you've been to church like 50 years, then you've had like 200 sermons probably on the Christmas story. Maybe we've had enough for a while on that. 
not that there's anything wrong, but we're losing the battle. And I'm not going to stand still and just keep pretending like we're winning. There's nothing I hate more than pretending as a leader. So let's sum it up. The church is going to keep crumbling. How do I know? Well, because I've read the ending. There's a falling away going on. The churches that are growing are ones that have decided to go to the rudiments of the world. And we could go that way. We could get a rock band. We could take down all the crosses. I could just talk about love and, and how 2022 is going to be your year. But you know, there's other churches that are growing too. And those are ones that are telling people the truth from God's word. And are reaching people with God's word. And they're not afraid to stand even when they look to the world like they're fools. But are not afraid to stand on God's word. Instead of believing every which way the wind of the world blows. The world can't even decide what it's right, what it thinks is going on, or what it thinks is right. Put our ear to this. Again, the onus is on us. I believe we can still make a difference. I'm not saying we're going to reverse what the world's doing. But how can we affect, and this is what I want you to think about as we go into this new year, as a church, as an individual, how can we reach people for Christ? Let us pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus Christ. And dear Lord, as we have a holiday here where we do like to spend time with our family and we like to take time to celebrate the birth of Christ, let us be sharing that with others around us. Let us be giving them the hope, the same hope that you gave us that long time ago in sending your son. Let us be sharing that with those around us. Dear Lord, let us not be a broken record. Let us not go into 2022 thinking if we can just do the same as we did last year and the year before that, and the year before that, that that'll be good. Let us know that we can do so much more when we put our trust and faith in you. And dear Lord, I ask you to be with all the families here as they go out. And as we all go out and we all think about your word and how we can affect those around us, and just guide us and direct us in everything we do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.